So we're here with Ori Hernstadt from Akiban, and I wanted to get a sense of what brings you to Oracle Open World. Bring me here is um, our own work uh, at uh, a company, uh, Akiban, uh, where we're um, developing technology to take SQL uh, to uh, a new level. Okay, so taking SQL to a new level, if you look at this massive conference, it's very impressive. There's 50,000 people in, in, uh, incredible. in the entire city. Uh, you know, people, people are just here to learn about the different software offerings. But this is essentially a conference that was built by the relational database. What you're doing is related to, to taking the relational database to the next level. Can you talk a little bit about what your company does and what's the founding principle? Sure. So there's a, a fundamental concept that uh, we're developing, and that is table grouping. And what table grouping does is um, identify um, almost entities from within your schema. So tables that, that form together an entity in your applications come together in this construct we call a table group. Um, what we're able to do with this is change the way um, we store and process data and the way we answer queries. Um, and so there's two direct effects to table grouping. The first one is that explicit joins, joins that you can see in a query that joins table A to table B to table C, those joins are free to execute. The second uh, element that comes into play is that now accessing a instance of this group of tables, say you know, customers with these orders and with these items and addresses and credit cards and everything related to it, um, accessing an instance is as easy as accessing a single row uh, in, a, in a regular relational system. The magic of table grouping is that it keeps SQL as the interface, but changes the operation underneath. So if we look at how people use the relational database, there's a lot of people in the industry who say things like relational databases are an antiquated concept. I mean, if you go to some of, the, some of the conferences that O'Reilly puts on, people say they use a relational database and you almost get the sense that they're talking from 2001, 2002. Could you talk a little bit about the trend in the industry to move away from databases and towards things like Mongo, towards things like Tokyo Cabinet, other... Sure. You know, the, there's possibly a hundred options out there at this point. Sure, so um, a little bit of perspective. Um, this antiquated concept that COD brought about in, in the, the, the late 60s and early 70s, um, I guess in, in computer terms it is antiquated, right? came right after the mainframe. But um, in reality, um, the concept that he brings is very powerful and mathematical in nature. He was trying to create a logical layer that abstracts you from how the databases actually work. Um, and if anything is antiquated, it's the implementations that were custom designed for the hardware and the resources of the time. And what Cod was trying to do is to create a logical layer that allows you to have a declarative language on top of it and a mathematical way of defining what you want, not how it's implemented. Um, I think there is a, um, an, 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 a new movement, um, uh, I think some have coined it as, as, as new SQL, where um, we're starting to look differently at how to implement the SQL construct. Um, MongoDB and Tokyo Cabinet and a bunch of others uh, belong to a different movement. Um, there's, a, there's a big name, NoSQL, which encompasses a lot of companies. But the idea there is to, is to put SQL to one side, put those capabilities to one side and say, if we didn't have that SQL to contend with, how would we approach things differently? And um, in, the, in the MongoDB um, example, um, much of it um, is very similar to what we used to call object databases, and now we call document databases. So the ability to take a complex um, object and, and put it directly and pu pull it directly from, uh, from a store. So let's, let's, let's try to dive into that a little bit. Uh, if you've worked with a relational database um, and you've taken it to its limits, you start to look into the history of databases, there's network databases, there's document databases. Right. This is the sort of thing that goes back 40 years right. at, at this point. Right. Um, but put what you do on that spectrum. Sure. So where, where are you in terms of, are you a document database? That's a, that's a very good question. We are first and foremost a relational uh, SQL database. Um, what we do under the hood is take insights um, about usage patterns that um, arrange 
schemas into groups and arrange data into trees or hierarchies. Um, so where I would place us is if there's a continuum of database usage, of data usage, and to, to, to one side we have uh, very operational, almost um, row or object-based systems, which are really concerned about how many rows can I get, get in and, 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 and put out. Um, and at the other extreme, we have the very analytical systems um, that started with uh, uh, Netizas and Verticas and all the way to Hadoop. Um, those two areas are, are, are highly contested. There's a lot of companies looking at them. The middle ground, the point where you say, well, I don't just need one object. I need um, um, more complex object. I need a few objects. I need to ask queries, reports that maybe don't take five hours, but this whole spectrum, um, that we fit right in the middle of that spectrum. So let me stop you a little bit, because from, from, a, from, a, practi from a practical perspective, if you're working with an application and you use a relational database, you get to the point where you have maybe two or three queries that are extremely problematic. Um, I'm going to play devil's advocate. I think a lot of the people moving to NoSQL are moving to NoSQL because maybe they just want to use the newest thing that's available. Um, tell me what you would tell someone who's using a database. It's, it's mostly operational, but there are a few queries that are extremely problematic. What, what, what should they do? Should they move to something like Hadoop? Should they move to something like Mongo? You're actually um, quite right in that. Um, th that's been our observation as well. As, w as we go out there, um, we find companies who say, you know, there's, there's, there's a world of usage that I do, but it's really this part, these few queries, or these few transactions, or these few operations that drive me crazy. And everything else works pretty, pretty much OK. Um, Many times we find that these are the queries that um, are somewhat complex, have a few joins. Um, many times they work on top of um, profiles, um, so they join information from many tables, um, and those become quite problematic. I think there's a, um, almost a, a, a gut reaction right now of, oh, it's all part of, of the relational problem and the SQL problem, and if we go to NoSQL, my problems will be magically solved. But in a sense, what, most, what, what NoSQL does is it, it doesn't even address this problem. It says this is not one of the things you can do in a database. You'll have to do it now in your application. What a database will do is store your objects or process a huge amount of data over time in, in the Hadoop case. Um, and th that's the message and the, the, the inspiration that we have is to come to those those operational um, uh, systems that use SQL and say, actually, SQL and normalization are not at the root cause of your problem. It's how we implemented them. And with an implementation underneath the hood that takes advantage of how you actually use the data, that understands the semantics of your data, um, we can resolve a lot of those problems. So let me just try to pair that back to see if I've got it right. So you, you've essentially looked at how data is stored in a database. I'm just going to make the statement that 99.9% .9 of the people who use relational databases don't understand relational calculus. They don't think about things like, where is my data being stored on the disk? Talk a little bit about what, so what makes that different. Why do you store it in a certain format? And how is that different from the way that the data is stored by default in something like MySQL? Well, what are the problems that you've identified? Sure. Um, I'd argue that a lot of people um, they may not understand the calculus, but SQL is one of the first tools you're given, right? A declarative language. Um, and wh what we've done is to, to realize that when you look at a schema, you'll f realize very quickly that, that the relationships that are defined those in those schema, they're there for a reason. They identify usage pattern, access patterns, right? Flowing from one, gr one table to the next. We take that, if you imagine a schema, we identify that some relationships are used way more often than others. Those are the joins that are actually expensive in the system. So we'll map those and try to put together the groups of tables that are very close together in, in, terms, of the, in, in terms of their usage. We then take each one of those groups of tables and we interleave the data. So as an example, um, a customer that has orders and orders have items, it's the classic. Um, 
Imagine shuffling two decks of cards and putting them together. We'll take those tables, take the rows, and shuffle them together such that they're organized in a way that the, the first customer is, is co-located in memory on disk, on SSD, with his orders, which are co-located with their items, with the next orders, with their items, et cetera, et cetera, to the next customer. So I took those three tables of customers' orders and items, and I kind of shuffled them together into one construct that we now call a group. What that means is that accessing a customer for free gets you all of his related information. Um, it means that the joins are pre-computed, so you don't need to, to do them as you operate. You actually do the work as data comes in. Okay, so I hear that, and I hear that answer, and I think to myself, if, if I'm running, let's say something like Drupal, or if I'm running a database that tracks educational content, and you know, I look at my I look at my application, I look at my performance. Performance is usually gated by a couple of queries that are just extremely problematic. Right. And I, I'm sitting in an architecture meeting and somebody says, you know, it, it's, it's time to move to Mongo. It's time to move part of my system to Mongo. Personally, as an architect, I see a problem in that I've got this relational database that I've been using for years and years and years. We know how to use it, we know how to support it. You know, um, maybe we use Oracle and uh, you know pay pay a trillion dollars for a support contract. And then, if someone wants to move only part of the data to a NoSQL solution, then I've got to manage all of that extra work. So, so tell me a little bit about what you do to try to answer that question. What I've heard you say is we sort of fix all the queries that are having problems. Um, like what? So. Um Taking um, Drupal is actually a, a, a pretty good example. We're, we've been um, looking at Drupal 7, working with Dries to, to, to understand their, their spectrum of needs and where they see problems. Mm -hmm. So um, Drupal, as a, as a CMS, has a, a, a basic entity or concept in it called a node. And a, lot, a node is uh, your blog post or your page or whatever content you're producing. When you actually start looking at, it, at, at the underlying database, um, that node has a lot of tables related to it, right? A lot of attributes related to it, all the way from its revisions, from um, what, user, what user has actually produced it, um, what comments exist for, to it, and so on and so forth. Um, in the big implementations, you have dozens and dozens of tables related to it. So now, if you think about it, you have this node object. And what we f often find when we go into those scenarios is exactly like you say, um, you get a few queries that want to know all of the nodes that have been updated in the last five minutes that have over five comments and that person X touched. When you think about those queries, they, they include four or five tables. When you run them, they make, th they make the database come to a crawl um, and they affect the, op the, the rest of the system as it operates. And so we can take those types of queries, th th there are great examples for what we do, and because they all fall into the same node group, all of these joins are exec executed for free. So that's exactly the kind of scenario that, that, that we're looking for. We're looking for. Um, the other scenario is just accessing a node. If you actually look what happens behind the scenes when Drupal loads a page, and this was actually a surprise for me. I'm used to seeing uh, very large systems do this very often. So bring um, very, very complex objects, a lot of rows back and forth. Um, I was surprised to see that Drupal has just as much complexity. And um, bringing a single node to present, so a single blog post, for example, includes a huge amount of back and forth to the database to bring all of the related parts. Um, and our mission is to make that a very simple single request to get the full node object with all of the related data. You, so you have a company yeah. and you, you are trying to sell a technology to real customers. And you deal with databases. Right. One of the reasons why I brought you here, we're trying to cover Java, but if you think about the work that we do in the industry, we're all writing applications that work with databases. Right. And there are different people in the industry. There are DBAs, there are programmers, there are people who work in operations. What's your target? Who are you trying to actually communicate with? Are you, are you, are you trying to talk to DBAs? Are you trying to make it easier for application developers? To, to create applications. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the different roles? Sure. Because you're sort of on the front lines. Sure. Um, I'd say I'm, I come from um, the DBA world. Um, and my first 
almost instinct is to go and solve those problems because I've been there before. But I see a, a trend where, um, and I think we all see it, where developers and DBAs um, start to merge. It doesn't happen everywhere and it happens slowly, but DBAs become um, more and more conscious of what it means to run a database. And it doesn't matter if it's NoSQL or SQL. A database is where you store your data. There's operational requirements from it. And my ultimate goal is to talk and service directly that developer. So I want to make that developer happy. Um, and what, what it means making him happy is that when he writes his application, it, it, it is written in such a way that he understands it, that it makes sense to him, and that it's not going to torture the DBA side of him. Um, so while we're starting with, with, with explicit problems, as, as, as we engage with companies, we, we see a lot of people defined as DBAs who struggle with these problems. Um, really, we want to bring this to, to, to developers who appreciate it and who are part of the same fabric of DBAs and developers. So you, you come at the problem from the perspective of a DBA. And what I got from that answer is that there are different roles and these different roles in the IT department have different expectations. Right. What would you as a DBA want developers to know about working with a database? Can you just take some time? Because, and the reason I'm asking is because there's, there's a bunch of traditionally um, conflict prone associations within the programming space. DBAs, programmers, programmers, operations, right. operations right. and DBAs. Right. What would you as a DBA want a programmer to know? before they even go near a database? I think the best companies are those where these distinctions are not set, right? So developers have responsibilities to the operational systems, and so do DBAs, and so, so do the ops guys. Um, I think w what developers have to understand is what, um, how the, 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 the code that they write impacts the execution of, of the system, what it actually means. But in a sense, I completely um, understand why developers come and say, hey, I want a NoSQL solution. Because there's so many levels of abstraction between them, if, you, if we take the RM for example, between them and how the system actually operates. And they go, wait a second, M my goal, what I'm really trying to do here is deliver s uh, a, a product, is deliver features for my clients. Not to understand how all these different layers map into each other and what the different performance implications are. And in some respects, I, I, I fully agree with them. And I think the uh, impedance mismatch between the object and the relational world has grown so much that the, the, the gut reaction is to kick back and say, no, I'm going to go no SQL. That's been my reaction. That's, that's a lot of where Akiba comes from. So what eventually I'd like for developers to do is not to worry about it so much, to understand that their objects map directly to groups, and for DBAs to not worry on the other side, as they know that, that they don't have to worry as much as they do today about, oh my goodness, those developers, look what they did again. They don't know what they're doing. They wrote a five-way joint, and it's killing my system. Um, I'd like to take at least some of that stress away. How do you feel about SQL generation tools? And specifically, I want to talk about Hibernate. Okay. So Hibernate is a huge Java library. Ev almost everybody uses Hibernate. Right. Um, DBAs hate it. In fact, I've heard a DBA say that Hibernate is another name for uh, a, um, a database failure load test. <laughs> so I, I, I'm a programmer, so I'm just going to say that I'm on that line. Talk to me about uh, what is it that Hibernate does and, and what is it that Hibernate does that makes DBAs freak out? Right. I think, um, so, so first of all, what Hibernate does is it takes your objects and maps them to database tables. And it takes your requests and max, maps them to SQL. And its job is to map between those two worlds. Um, it's probably one of the more um, capable and complicated libraries that do that. Um, Rails is, is uh, the Ruby on, from the Ruby on Rails, um, is another example, but it's, um, if you will, a simpler, more straightforward implementation of the same. DBAs don't have such a negative opinion of the active record part of Rails from, from, That's from up, I up, 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 the specifically singling out Hibernate. Right. I have um, heard a lot of negative feedback from DBAs. My experience it, is like, being... So, so 
you'll walk up to a DBA and they'll sigh and say, oh, are you, are, are you using Hibernate? Right. You know, to just why is that? Well, what Hibernate tends to do um, is um, table explosion, meaning as you try to uh, evolve your objects, it produces more and more and more tables. So two things happen. Now your queries have to span more and more tables, and when you retrieve an object, it needs to bring all these different parts from different tables together. And that's a very expensive operation. Multiply that by who knows how many of these, how many users you have, how many entities or objects you bring back into, in, into work, and that becomes really, really difficult. Um, what I think the, 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 the second thing about Hibernate, b beyond the um, uh, table explosion, is that uh, it allows you to do uh, very complex mapping. So you can um, map an object into tables in many different ways. Um, and that makes it um, very complex to optimize. And um, it's easy to get it wrong. Okay, so I've, I've certainly been a part of getting it wrong in the past. And that's, that's, that's why I'm asking. If you, if, you, if you use Hibernate and you set your max fetch depth to yeah. something like, yeah. you know, Infinity. Perfect example. You end up with a, a SQL query that that you know, twenty pages long. So, my understanding is that what you're talking about essentially takes care of all those joins in one place. So, so is it essentially making it easier to use tools like Hibernate? I, I guess. Let me just set this up a little bit. When you develop software uh, that uses a database, you have to have a DBA yep. because a DBA understands the architecture of the database, right. where the data is stored. Right. You don't have to have a chip designer sit around right. and sit down and say, well, what you're doing doesn't really work. Right. We have enough abstractions, and it seems like the, it seems like the abstractions work uh, as far as the CPU is concerned. But they don't work as far as storage is, uh, is concerned, and that's, that's kind of what you're trying to fix. That's exactly right. So that, that impedance mismatch that, that, that I mentioned before, that, that, that gap between the relational table and the objects is um, what was at the core of, of my previous experience and what we're really trying to fix. And um, Hibernate is a great example because when we go to clients, one of our first questions is, do you use Hibernate? And then whenever they, they, they say yes, our, our, our eyes almost light up and it's not because we don't like them, but it's because we know what we're gonna find. So show us your schema and you open pages of hundreds and hundreds of tables. And it's not like their system is totally complex, it's usually three or four main entities in their system, but just spans so many tables that one, they don't know what their schema means anymore, it's very hard to take care of it, and they start hitting problem after problem. They fix one, it impacts another, and, and they're just on this endless chase. Um, so with the same guys, it's very quick for us, the, 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 um, if you will, the semantic information is already within Hibernate, understanding the object. It's very easy for us to map that to, to table groups, and suddenly, instead of hundreds of tables, the schema still has those tables, but it also organizes them into three or four main groups. Mm -hmm. um, and now, accessing each one of those groups is free, free to join, meaning you can run a query on top of any number of tables, and that query is free, and you can get that object, that group, in one request, in one go. So, so, so it's, it's exactly trying to, to, to resolve that divide, that, that, that thing that makes people hate Hibernate. We'd like them to, to not worry about it anymore and not worry about exactly how it's implemented because the mapping will be much more direct. So when you walk into a client and they say we use, we use Hibernate, yep. you say great. Yep. Um, what are some of the other things they say? What would you do if you worked for a client, what would you do to avoid this problem from the, from the start? Like, so what would you say use an alternative? Like there's a Java object relational mapping tool called iBatis. Right. Um, would you use that instead? Would you recommend that Java programmers just craft SQL statements by hand? Um, I don't think that Hibernate is uniquely bad in how it does mapping. If anything, it's very capable. Um, I think it got its reputation because a lot of the larger systems use it. It's very popular, and so they really start hitting those challenges. Um, I don't think RMs are wrong. I don't think mapping to a database, whatever the database model is, is wrong. That, that abstraction, abstractions are, are, are a good thing to do. Um, so I would definitely not advise um, developers to write SQL code, though they usually end up doing that. 
right? They usually end up solving problems just like that, going in and writing their own SQL. Um, instead, I, I, I think the model is right. You write your application, there's an abstraction to where the data actually, ac actually lives, and you don't need to know all the finer granular details about how those are defined. Um, I think that the divide that exists today is part of the problem and part of what we want to, to, to challenge and to resolve if possible. A lot of programmers are in the situation where they have a production website, it's falling over, there's been an explosion of data in the last few years, everything is social, everything is you know, geolocated. Um, what if I want to use your product now, what do I do? We um, are focused on, on, on resolving the problem areas of the application, not just ripping apart everything that you have in place and starting over again. Uh, I just don't think that's useful. I've been in that situation before, it doesn't work. So um, the way we design the system is uh, for my SQL users who are currently experiencing problems, um, and it's not like all of their application is falling over. There are parts, they, they'll know. If you go in, you'll ask them, do you know what your, your problem is? And they'll go, this query, I hate this query. It runs so many times, I have to run it, and it's just slow. So our approach is to go in and spin up um, um, an Akiban server, that's the product we're developing, um, plug it into the replication stream. So now it's just another one of the slaves running off of the MySQL master, and redirect all of the problem traffic to our slaves. So you don't have to rip apart anything. You can do it very, very progressively. But usually they'll point us right at you know, the, the, the two or three problem areas. We'll spin up the nodes, take only those problem areas, redirect them to our pool of, slave, of slaves, um, and that's it. And now they can progressively improve the problem areas that they have. How, so how long does that take? From someone saying, we've got a problem, well, we want to find a solution to it. I mean, does it, take, does it take a week to do this? Is there anything that people need to do to set up the problem? Not really, it's just another slave. So how long, the question to ask is, how long does it take for you, a developer, or do you have an application, to set up another slave? So once you set up the slave, we'll just um, um, take that stream, um, direct it to the Akiban server, and you start asking queries on top of it. Now there's, again, progressive improvements that you can do. You can uh, define the grouping better. There's all sorts of optimization that you can do. But to get it up and running, it's the same amount of work as setting up a slave. OK, this is my last question. What are the sort of performance improvements that you've seen? I mean, I've used MySQL pretty heavily. If you can get stuff into the query cache, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty fast. So, so what, what sorts of uh, performance numbers well, have you seen? We've gotten um, 10, uh, 50, 100 times improvements. Um, what's important to, to say here is that this is for operational load. So this is not for analytical systems that you put aside and, and you, know, you go and you query them later. This is for systems who ingest data in real time and answer queries that are operational. So you have clients waiting for them on the other side. Um, to imagine those queries, imagine a three or four way join that, that, that on whatever your main entity in the system is, and you're trying to figure out the last 100 that did transaction X, or all of the ones that fit profile Y. Um, those are the kind of things that we can do at, um, um, at 10 to 100 times uh, uh, improvement. All right, well thanks for uh, joining us today. Thank you very much.